Three years ago, a small team made up of six people across the world, Norway, America, the Netherlands, and Australia, took to themselves to create an experience like no other. A fan game which let you explore a fully recreated park from the movie Jurassic World. Every detail meticulously created from the ground up, from visuals, code, and animations, and even original music. The project took the community by storm, with over 50,000 players and millions of views on social media. So how did a team like Dimensional Digital go from nothing to a project like Jurassic Explorer? And what lies ahead for these developers? I think every game you make is also a journey that you go through. It's kind of like it has its own story. And I think a part of a story is a battle <laughs> in one way. It can be really hard. And I think every developer's gone through something that's, that's really difficult. You wouldn't do it if you didn't love it as well. So it's always kind of a battle. You can't let yourself get yourself down. In an industry like this, you have to have a sense of not even never giving up. It's more just really, truly believing in yourself. As soon as you doubt yourself, you're done. My name is Michael Pierce and I'm the creator of Jurassic Explorer. I'm 21, nearly 22. I come from Perth, Western Australia. It's a really like secluded, isolated city. Um, so it's kind of weird growing up here, especially as a game developer. I'm a 3D environment artist, which means that I make a lot of 3D models and I love game development. While I was growing up, especially with my brother, we would always do different things. We would try to kind of open up games and see how they work or, or do mods or, or texture hacks and stuff like that. So when I was maybe like seven years old, one of the first times I ever remember kind of working on art for a game was opening it up, seeing the files in the games and editing the textures with GIMP. Being able to open up a game, especially with a franchise you love, and, and create content for it and expand the world and expand how people made these games is, is really fun and it's fascinating. Would you describe yourself as a Jurassic Park fan? Yes, absolutely. Growing up with it like my whole life and uh, I used to watch it as a kid and used to terrify the heck out of me. I remember just seeing velociraptors in the kitchen scene and just I used to never sleep much. <laughs> I remember, you know, kind of growing up with it, it came out very early when we were kids and then as we grew up there was Jurassic Park 3 and um, we eventually watched The Lost World as well and then after that we waited for years and years to get some sort of glimpse of Jurassic Park 4 which eventually turned to Jurassic World and, and that really kind of changed everything. I remember coming out of the movie theatre, whole way through I was smiling but I was just like shaking and like I was so excited because seeing the park actually be real and open for once. I mean, we've only kind of seen that before with Jurassic Park, but this was open to the public for the first time and we never really saw what that would be like and, and it, they did an amazing job making it feel like a, a real theme park. So, you know, you're like, I want to go there, I want to <laughs> explore this and, and see everything. Something about these movies which was so 
unique is the locations that they're in and to me they're so memorable the the characters within themselves are almost as memorable as the dinosaurs and, and the people that are in the movies seeing the park open and have like kids looking at dinosaurs and, and running around you have like Zack and Grey like being excited for the T-Rex kingdom and stuff like that just blew my mind away and, and uh, Colin and all the people on the team just did an incredible job at, at every aspect of that. I decided one day to randomly <laughs> try to recreate one of the key buildings from uh, Main Street and the park from the movie, which was the Innovation Center, which is this kind of like, you know, pyramid-like iconic building in the center of the park. And I did this in around maybe nearly six hours and I posted it on Facebook. And this was back then when I really didn't quite know how to 3D model correctly. I was using kind of a primitive version of modeling by doing it directly in Unity 3D with the assets they had on hand. So it wasn't really the correct way to do it, but that's kind of where things started. And I posted that to Facebook and I posted it to Twitter and a few other social medias. And I remember a lot of people, especially in the Jurassic community, were like, wow, this is really cool. Like you should keep going with this. And, and after a while, I kind of expanded from that and, and started to make terrain um, I would build the island around it and then block out different parts of it and different parts of the park that we knew at that time because back then at this stage the movie wasn't out all we knew about the park was anything from the trailers so that even back then there was still very very few shots of the park but I managed to kind of do my research look frame by frame and and see what I could see from the park layout and that's kind of where the beginning of kind of the prototype for Jurassic Explorer, which was Jurassic World 3D project. What I did to kind of map out the layout of the park was just watch a lot of the trailers that they had at the time. There are a lot of old shots of the park which used old CGI and old compositions that weren't accurate to the final park's layout. There were concept arts that they used in the park map which was just completely different to the CGI that they ended up using. So I did a lot of things maybe two or three times because it just kept changing as the movie progressed. I, I can't even <laughs> say how much time it took because it's just like I know this park better than anyone I know right now because it's just you have to research it so much to know every aspect of it. I have a folder on my computer called reference folder <laughs> and it literally has maybe close to a thousand individual screenshots of just different angles of the park, different pictures of the sets, different pictures of set props and clothing and all sorts of things. Everything is divided into each individual folder with, uh, you know, things like from different locations like the Mosasaur Arena and Main Street has the biggest by far. And I just have all this media that's all combined into this one folder and I just try to collect as much as I can so then I can make sure everything is accurate. Jurassic World 3D Project was in development for over a year. At the end of that first project or, or prototype, I still didn't know how to correctly 3D model. At that time, I was getting a lot better at shapes and you know making sure that everything looked the way it was supposed to look, but it was still not quite there because I wasn't using the right software. And once we eventually moved on to Jurassic Explorer, that's when me and even Andreas, uh, our organic modeler, we both switched programs. He switched from Blender to ZBrush and I switched from Unity 3D to 3ds Max. And that made a huge difference. Like the difference is night and day. Like it, it was just, everything was clean and, and you could see that geometry was so much more advanced. Not just my understanding of 3D was a lot better, but just the visuals came together better and, and it just really looked looked great. The first project, I think it was really necessary for me to go through because as a developer, I made a lot of mistakes and those mistakes at the time might have seemed bad, but it's really what I needed to do to get me to where I wanted to be with Jurassic Explorer. It was mainly me kind of getting the layout correct and, and uh, initially didn't plan to ever release it as a real thing or ever put it out there to the public to download because of the fans and because of the communication and feedback I ended up putting out three versions of it and then from there we kind of evolved into Jurassic Explorer.
Jurassic Explorer lets you explore a 3D recreation of pretty much the entire park from the movie Jurassic World and um, my favourite aspect of especially Jurassic World is just how they brought this to life and made it feel like it was a real thing and, and even as a kid playing like Jurassic Park Operation Genesis my favourite part was the parks and, and making them feel real so the core of it is just feeling like you're in a dinosaur park. None of this would have been possible without the help of the other team members. My name is Bernard Kyer. I'm uh, 32 and I was born and raised in Florida. My name is Zach Bond. I am 18 and I grew up in New Jersey. I'm River. I'm from Amsterdam and I am 20 years old. The biggest thing that I had going into Jurassic World was wanting to experience what a functional Jurassic Park was like. The biggest thing for Jurassic Explorer for me was the idea of being able to walk into that park and see it, and see it functioning, and see it alive, because we didn't get a lot of that in the movie. And I feel like a lot of people who went into the movie were expecting to get to experience the park more. So I think if anything, it really hit on that desire to be able to walk through the park and experience it and see it as a real thing. It's just the park open, you're free to go wherever, do whatever. And you can see like all the bits from the movie, but it's also, you see it the way you want to see it, instead of in a certain order and from a certain angle, but you're not really free to like look around yourself at your own pace. Now you know the world from the movies, you know it from everything, the books, and you know it from just talking about it. So it's sort of this big thing that you already know about, but you want to explore more of it. So these uh, toys, well, the kind of figures and plushies and different collectibles that I have of one of my favorite games growing up, which was this golf game, Pena. Um, it's kind of an obscure game and it's a bit random to have this stuff around my room, but um, I grew up with this game and especially its colors and art style and characters really resonate with me, so that's kind of why I have that stuff. Um, How does a game like Pena influence your game development? Well, like I said, I think the art style, like just the way that it's like very colorful and, and um, for me as an artist, I, I think that really represents kind of what we try to go for um, when it comes to, you know, color palettes and, and trying to make things look visually happy. So you're a big Nintendo fan? Yes, very much. I grew up with all sorts of Nintendo systems. Nintendo 64, GameCube, the Wii, the Wii U, 3DS, everything. There's so many people who have like literally made <laughs> incredible games and incredible software in like their mom's basement. You know, like there's, I don't think you need a particular setup to be good at something or, or to be successful. I don't think that uh, defines what type of content you put out or, or make. Um, I think really you just need what works for you and you just need the drive to continue and, and focus on actually making it. That's, that's, you shouldn't even think about your setup to be honest, like that's not even in my mind at all. It's just about the game. So. Good communication between each team member was the key to a successful project. It's hot in here too. It's <laughs> my brother's dying in the corner. <laughs> oh, oh. And it's also summer in Australia. Well, it's Florida, so it's summer here too. Oh yeah, it's always summer in Florida. Okay. It, this is basically how you guys communicate all the time, right? I mean, obviously, maybe not video, but you're always sort of a screen away from each other, right? Yeah, it's a bit weird <laughs> to think that like we yeah. made a game across the world. 
there was a post on Facebook that was asking for a musician, asking for a composer for Jurassic Explorer. I was at a point in my life where, although music had played such a very large role in it, it was no longer a focus. I've always been interested in what theme park music for Jurassic Park would sound like. If you were walking through Jurassic Park, what, what would be the music that you would hear playing through the speakers? You know, what would be the music when you first arrive? You know, what music's playing in the visitor center? We don't know. And so, like, those sort of things excite me because it adds to that experience. It makes it seem more real. Wanting to get back into doing music again, wanting to do that project, wanting to do all these other little things, this is a project that's actually going to allow me to do all of these things. You know, that's why... I put so much into it because it, it really, I was like, okay, this is me starting all over again. This is me getting to where maybe I can be marketable. This is me getting to where I can actually explore these ideas that I've had for years. It, it was a very good happenstance, fate. I don't know what word best to use, but it, it was definitely one of those things. If you did have a studio where you guys were all together and like in a physical location, how do you think your work would change? If the internet goes out, all of this ceased to exist, and that's like terrifying. <laughs> so like that would be a huge advantage, but yeah. Didn't that happen one time? Like you were like yes. uploading something? Yeah, it was during our first tour video and demo. Basically the first time we were ever going to show it to the public, and then it was like, oh, yeah. no internet for you. It was just before we released our very first tour video, which was kind of like our public showing of Jurassic Explorer for the first time. It was like the day before, and we're getting ready and everything and then for whatever reason our internet was gone for like three days <laughs> i was really stressing out because we put out a date and people were expecting something we had people who already sent things to and they were relying on us to put it out on that date, and i just felt so out of control <laughs> when you're so locked down to kind of being online and if if you don't have access to the internet all of it disappears, and that's that can be really stressful and kind of chaotic. Where did he go? Yeah. And like it was like what three days I think before we even like heard from you. Yeah. Or like, you like <laughs> I got back on the last day. I'm like, guys, I'm alive. I'm uploading it yeah. right now. Don't worry. Right. Like, that was a little scary. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's happened more than once. Like I feel like there's an, almost a curse going on because it always happens during those important tour videos that we need to get things on time and, and during our schedule, but um, it all works out in the end, luckily, so that's, that's good. Thankfully, Michael had a helping hand within the family, who helped forward the game's development. My name's Brandon Pierce, I'm 24 and I'm from Australia. I'm a programmer and a game designer. So I'm Michael's brother, so because of that, basically everything he's ever done, I've always kind of been in the background seeing what he's doing. Our rooms are literally side by side, so anytime I like go into his room and look at his computer, I'll see what he's working on. So I've been doing game development and programming for about 10 years now. I actually didn't always get too interested in programming until about 14 years of age when I actually wanted to create mods. So I started off doing uh, Minecraft mods. I started working on a project called Aether. The Aether is this mod which actually adds an opposite to a dimension in the game called the Nether. It's kind of like this hellish realm that had like pigmen and lava and fire and all this stuff. So we wanted to create an opposite of that, sort of this like heavenly dimension that was in the skies, but we wanted to add a spin to it. We wanted to have it be called sort of this hostile paradise where it looks like a paradise, it feels like a paradise, but it's quite hostile. There's lots of creatures out there that are just out to get you. And it was very, very popular. So basically from all that experience, I've learned all of my programming, all of my game design skills. And um, I think it just goes to show that it's very valuable to work on these personal projects. So I think in an industry like this, you have to have a sense of just really, truly believing in yourself and never, not even never giving up. It's more just that you can't let yourself get yourself down. Doesn't matter if other people are constantly telling you you can't do this. I've had that for many years. But when it comes to yourself, as soon as you doubt yourself, you're done. And that can never happen. Uh, I've always had really fond memories of Jurassic Park. When I was younger, I always used to watch it like religiously, um, again with my brother. And um, yeah, it was just it was just always like this 
this movie and this this whole series that just had so much importance to me. I always had like nightmares of raptors chasing me down hallways and even though for some reason like as a kid I probably shouldn't have been watching it. I don't know, just, I was always drawn to dinosaurs, I was always drawn to just that concept of having a working park where dinosaurs have come back to life. I do actually remember eating food like a T-Rex, that was one of the things that I did as a kid for some reason. I was so obsessed with T-Rexes that I wanted to be one, so I, w I used to like get out like my little two fingers, like, because obviously they got like the short hands and I would just like eat like steak like a T-Rex just with my mouth like it was so stupid but yeah I guess as kids like you just your imagination is so wild and so I just I just went with it as a kid. Hey guys my name is Andreas I'm a 3D artist and a video game developer living in Oslo Norway. I'm about to go to a Halloween party that's why I have all this stuff on. <laughs> Jurassic Explorer is uh, the project that I've worked on that I'm the most proud of and it's definitely the biggest one uh, I've ever done. Taking uh, many years to complete, hundreds uh, if not uh, almost a thousand hours of my time has gone into <laughs> that project so it's uh, definitely a lot and it's uh, really been worth it. You know there's videos of, uh, of Jurassic Explorer on YouTube with uh, over 4 million views so it's uh, <laughs> It pays for itself just uh, having your name on that stuff. And I'm so proud of the team uh, as well. I just made a few dinosaurs, but uh, Michael and the other developers, they are the ones that really put in the hard work and uh, did all of the technical aspects of the game, putting everything together. So uh, big props to them, definitely. The feedback from the community has also been amazing. It's amazing to see people uh, liking uh, what you worked so hard on and, and praising it. So a uh, big thank you to the community as well. I'm really grateful for uh, the uh, Jurassic Explorer team for letting me grow as an artist uh, over the years. When I joined the project, I really didn't know anything about uh, 3D sculpting and uh, artistry or animation, or, uh, nothing like that. And now, uh, four years later, I'm taking a bachelor's degree as a video game developer. So um, that's all thanks to Jurassic Explorer and the team. When I first saw the T-Rex, I I thought it was the best Jurassic Park like fan model I've ever ever seen. It was a great model. I showed it to friends and whatnot. It was just an awesome, awesome model. Yes, it looks real. It looks, uh, you know, there's a lot of detail. That's also what the original movies uh, with animal comics, where that looked real, was all the small detail. I don't understand how quickly he was able to do it. Um, there were times where it would be like you'd get a blob in one, and the next one the blob had a head, and the next one I'm done. I'm like, it, it's been a couple hours. How did how did you do that? Um, but it was it was really interesting seeing that evolution of those animals and those creatures come to life. I was very believing of the fact that these were coming to life. That you know you get to watch the Gallimimus and it's running around, and then it's hurting with the other Gallimimus, and you know they're interacting with each other so i find that whole process so fascinating actually getting to watch all that come to life and happen it's pretty damn amazing that we even have dinosaurs walking around in the game considering that many fan projects have recreations of the park but they don't actually have dinosaurs in it so to actually have dinosaurs that kind of mimic this idea that they're alive i think that was really cool thankful for being able to work on so many AI, different AI systems. I was able to use that, you know, as a step forward and kind of become more experienced in that area. It was a lot of fun to kind of, to mess with things like this that I never had an opportunity to kind of mess with those behaviors before. We learned a lot throughout the process. And so, especially like with Michael's work, getting to see an almost completed season one by the time I joined, being blown away by the level of detail in that. I'm like, how do you extract that building from two or three frames in a movie? Like, I don't even know how you begin that, but the, the dedication to getting it right and getting it as close as possible and producing something that looked like it. So you could put a photo of it and a photo of the real set next to each other and be like, okay, this, this is that. I mean, if you look at, uh, there are some pictures out there with like, 
set photos of the game next to each other. And it just looks the same, which is very cool. Just to see like how close it is to the actual thing. That was definitely one of the big uh, things that sold me on the project. I was like, this isn't just some kid playing around on a computer. This is actually someone who is talented and knows what they're doing. I think at the end of season one, I had worked so hard that when we got to the end of it, I could not for the life of me figure out a sufficient melody for the Innovation Center. Michael actually ended up sending me an idea he had. It speaks, I think, a lot to the musicality that Michael has too, that he could even hear something or even think something thematically and musically to be able to, to pass along to me. That was one of those fun challenges where, even though I couldn't quite figure it out, I worked with Michael and just getting that inspiration, understanding what he needed more. And then finally him actually sending me something saying, here's something, let's try this. And then developing that, that became the Innovation Center theme. Michael being the lead developer, his talents are also in being a lead developer, being able to communicate to a team, being able to pass along information, being able to get us motivated, being able to show the example, to set the example so that we might go through a lull of a two week, three week period where not a lot of stuff gets done. And Michael's like, I did this, 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 and this. And the rest of us are like, okay, maybe, maybe we should get off our butts and do more. It wasn't just his talents of being uh, a modeler and creating everything, but also being a model developer. It, you know, really, it, it's top down at that. You, you have good leadership, you have a good team, uh, they motivate the team, the team is motivated to work, the team works hard, and you end up getting more than what you put into it. But with a project that's based on an existing IP, the team didn't just want to make things that were featured in the series. They wanted to push for a unique story that tied the experience together creative ways to make the project unlike anything out there. When this project was started, I honestly thought it was just going to be a 3D model-like experience. I thought you were just going to go into the park and you were just going to see the models and honestly not even have dinosaurs. Michael actually decided to add some story elements of contextualizing what this world is and why you're actually being able to experience that park. The intro to the game was a was a really cool experience and a really cool way to just kind of kickstart the, the whole thing and get players dropped into the world. To believe the world that you're exploring, you need a story that puts you in that situation. I personally came up with the whole Mr. DNA's story, which is um, that he has this kind of handmade golden machine that's called the simulation machine and that machine simulates the past to let his guests, which is you, explore the locations. It was really good in giving context to why you're there and how all of this ties together. Sort of like a time machine in a way, um, but anything can happen. I definitely thought it was it was very cool and a unique thing to have your own storyline in a fan game, which is you know something you don't see often. So the idea of being able to kind of put our own touch in, in a pretty interesting way, how this whole thing is working, how you're in this game, and kind of just put this more kind of professional touch on it instead of it just being, you know, plop, you're here, have fun. It was, it was very cool. It ended up really nice where you kind of go in with the tutorial and then you go through and you have this storyline to go with it and explain how everything works. Howdy y'all, my name is Michael Coy. I'm a video producer in Kansas City, and I voiced Mr. DNA. <laughs> so I'm a video producer by trade, and I'm always looking at the message boards, looking for work or offering work. And someone had posted this thing about playing Mr. DNA in a video game. So they had just gave me seven lines to say. I perversely did the entire speech. 
Um, so I sent it in. I'd never been a voice actor before, and it was just so much fun to do. Well, in many ways, I think that this was the part that I was born to play, because I had watched this speech about 50,000 times as a kid. I think I had the entire movie memorized at one point. I mean, the second I saw it, I just snapped right into it. Oh, Mr. DNA, where did you come from? From your blood. Just one drop of your blood contains billions of strands of DNA, the building blocks of life. So. so in the movie, Greg Burson voiced him. I don't know who he is, but he has a great voice. Um, voice here is a little bit different. This is kind of like Mr. DNA if he was in his mid-twenties. Um, maybe in later editions, the I'll get, be a little gravelier. I'll have to get on smoking some cigarettes and whatever. I thought it was great. It was just communicating by email, but it was just so cordial and everyone was so nice and appreciative. And... It was a wonderful working experience. And I love that they gave Mr. DNA like a backstory and like a character and a motivation. <laughs> like he has this beautiful speech <laughs> at the end. There really is something special about these locations, isn't there? A feeling of joy, of wonder, of innocence. These creatures, this park, they're amazing. They're a reminder that Life finds a way! And it, it was just wonderful. Like, I got to, like, emote as Mr. DNA. I thought the end product was fantastic. You know, I, I can't believe that this was done on a, like, no budget at all. Um, th that's hard. <laughs> so I'm really, I was amazed. I was watching this video game, and then suddenly I'm in it. And I was just like, it was a surreal experience, but because because it was so professional, um, because it was so well done, it didn't even seem like I belonged in that. So I thought it was great. Being a fan project, it did allow for some flexibility. If someone needed more time with something or if someone had to step away, it wasn't exactly one of those things where it's like, okay, well, you're, you're fired, we're replacing you. It was more of a, you have to take care of your life first. And I think that's one of the harder balances, I think, for people to recognize. Sometimes life really does have to come first. Bills have to come first, you know, uh, our jobs have to come first. Whether or not it was Andreas having to go away or someone, hey, I haven't slept for three days because I've been up working on <laughs> all the models, uh, it, it was something that we all had to be comfortable and accept that you know this was a dynamic environment with a bunch of different people and we all had certain individual needs like that. With any project there are always setbacks that can keep you from progressing. Fan project or not, Jurassic Explorer was no exception. I think game development is very intense in an environment that's so intense and requires you to work so hard every day on the same thing can lead to things like depression. I know I've had a lot of days where I'll be trying to work on something and if it's not working the way I want it to, I might have a bit of a mental breakdown or like sometimes it's just a lot harder than the situation actually is. Leading up to season two's release, I was like really stressed out. I remember just like we had those days, kind of every day of those last few weeks where you would literally wake up, work, 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 until you fall asleep. You're never truly resting because you're waking up at the same place that you work and then you're going to sleep the same place that you work. You'll be trying to enjoy like a friend's birthday party or something and then you're just like constantly thinking about the project in the back of your mind and you feel like you can never truly be and just relax. But I usually try to push myself away and kind of step back a bit. You wouldn't do it if you didn't love it as well. It's always kind of a battle. I think it's really stressful, but the rewards that come from it out outweigh the stress most of the times. I think there's nothing I'd rather do, like, honestly. After years of hard work, the team was ready to set forth and put their work out there for the world to enjoy. And nothing could prepare them for how launch day would change their lives.
it was incredibly amazing just seeing it all come together releasing it and then watching all the people play it on youtube and and on social media just seeing the reactions to something if you're spending like a year working on a game you will forget why you even did something or you know what's going to surprise someone and then once it's all done and out there and people play it for the first time you're like oh yeah that's like impressive like you completely forget that because you've seen it every day for a year but this is the first time people are seeing that i just remember watching the videos just sitting down all these people like their face would light up and, and they would be so happy and like they would get it and I think that's really the most like happy feeling I felt is just seeing people get what we wanted to set out and accomplish. Good evening ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're gonna play the finally released Jurassic Explorer. Welcome to Jurassic Explorer! Playing Jurassic Explorer, which is a 100% fan-made game of basically just Jurassic World Simulator, where you get to simulate a Jurassic Park guest. Fan-made thing which somebody has made and it's absolutely incredible, I've seen little bits of it. The attractions from the park in the game, which is awesome. So coming from other projects in the past that have actually uh, had some success on YouTube and within like social media, uh, it wasn't as much of a shock to me as it might have been for some of the other team members. So it was actually quite interesting and, and really cool to see some of the other team members experience what I experienced back then. You can't even come to terms with how many people are playing the game and how many people are actually watching it. Even if they're not playing it, at the very least they're watching someone else play the project and it's just, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. It, it almost like takes you out of reality for a second because you can't really come to terms with it. Oh, there! Oh, the other looks great! Dude, that is so incredibly well done! Oh, wow! Whoa! Love it, I can't, I can't get enough of it. I'm literally have filmed these like, all back to back to back to back to back. Oh my god! Dilophosaurus! Oh, there it is! The iconic dinosaur! Oh, so cool! I can't stop saying that for this game. The Jurassic community was in a fit of excitement and celebration. Their videos have racked up millions of views. Despite Jurassic World coming out, I think there was a major lack of Jurassic Park and Jurassic World projects in general and games. And generally speaking, Jurassic Park games have a big history of kind of failing before, you know, everyone gets really excited and then they disappear. The difference between the initial version and what we have now is obviously insane. It's night and day and yeah, it's been nice seeing it grow over the years and being able to come back to it and see what's been added and it's nice to see it evolving. The Mr. DNA pixel side-scrolling game I thought was a fairly genius little addition uh yeah i really i mean the shop i i have, I have a bit of a thing for shops <laughs> in games <laughs> anything that lets me buy things and upgrade things with money of any form really makes me happy so yeah that was a, a really good change to me and we only saw one slice of what it would look like in the film world you know we missed the park opening we missed any holiday events we missed all that being able to see what an alternate universe Jurassic World looks like, like if Jurassic World never got shut down for example, being able to see what that looks like through your unique additions was really cool. Something that we'd never ever see in the film universe but it still felt like something that was realistic. In terms of games from the, like official games from the franchise, we've been pretty neglected. Considering the size of the franchise and how successful it is and the amount of money it's brought in, the fact that we've really had Jurassic World Evolution and then mobile games in 15, 18 years, wherever it's been, is a little bit bizarre. But the fact that the fans love this community so much and have so much drive for the franchise means we keep getting these new games is really nice to see. It does mean we get a lot of projects that don't really go anywhere. They sort of start and people get excited and then people realize, you know, this takes a lot of work at the end of the day to make a game like this. Within the first 24 hours of its launch, Jurassic Explore had over 1,000 downloads and now has over 50,000 players around the world. At the time, I've never actually been a part of a full game release, so it was a it was a great feeling. We sat in that VC and we talked for a while, and it was it was a great feeling to be able to kind of see first reactions and feel a bit of success after a lot of failures I had over the years of not completing projects. To be able to be a part of something, I mean, there obviously are obviously some other good fan projects out there, but when you compare it to a lot of other ones, it's just it's amazing, in my opinion, what. Jurassic Explorer is as a fan project all that it has to offer as a as a fan project and it was a great feeling it was so interesting because to me it was incredibly relieving because it's like oh my god it's finally out there like people can enjoy it 
but then after like maybe the next day I was like well now what <laughs> like and I think me and everybody on the team um had this experience and and Bernard and I kind of came up with the name we had like post-launch depression where you were just kind of like what now like <laughs> you just spend so long working on something and then suddenly you're not and it's like I don't know what to do with myself oh you could do this and you could do this and you're like I want to work on that I want to make that reality and I think that's one of the reasons why from season one we spent maybe a month break and then we were like okay we have to return to this project because it's just too much fun so that's why I made season two and and that's kind of how it's been going for like three years This year, the team has come across many unique opportunities, including the opportunity to record live orchestral versions of some of the music from the game. Early this year, I ended up getting the opportunity to be able to record a couple of pieces from Jurassic Explorer, both season one and season two. We only released season two a couple months prior to that. So it was, it was really kind of interesting getting to go through that process from having written the music and then a friend of a friend needed instrumentalists to record and music to record. I volunteered to assist. It took a few months, it was a couple of different sessions, but it was a, a pretty fascinating uh, experience to be able to do. For season two, one of the tests that we had run was trying to write a piece that replicated a tree for their bed from Jurassic Park, which had that kind of semi-lullaby feel to it. And as that piece developed, I was like, wait a minute, I hear a string line in this. And so I recorded myself playing violin and viola, put it all together and sent it to Michael. And it kind of spurred that talk again of like, what would it be like to actually record this? Like, wouldn't that be cool to have an actual orchestra record this? I have a friend of mine who has had some of his pieces recorded by an orchestra and you just pay them a certain amount, uh, depending on the length of the piece and everything. And so we flirted with the idea. We had talked about our goals for the next year for 2019. And one of the goals was like, you know what? I would really like to see if we can't get some of our music recorded. And then this came along. So it was just kind of like a, I, I don't want to say happenstance because that makes it that that kind of lessens it a little bit. That was not a uh, oh well. We hope this happens. It was literally something we we're like we need to figure out how to have, how we can have this happen. And then it showed up, and we're like, okay, there it is. You know, <laughs> there it is. And so we did it. The idea and the hope of actually getting a full orchestra to maybe record it is still there. Uh, I'm interested. I'm interested and excited to actually have that process happen because part of the process I think is so fascinating is actually being there as the person who wrote it and hearing that music come to life. I insist on being there when they're born. Um, <laughs> but the, but I mean, the reality of it is, it did feel like a birth in a way, because it's this abstract idea that existed really only in my head that I then performed that a computer gave some semblance of sense to. But it, a computer is not a living, breathing person. It's not performing it on the real instruments. It's not doing it acoustically into a real environment where it's really being recorded by microphones. To have instruments come in, like the horn player, she was the first one uh, to perform it besides myself, and to hear her playing the horn and playing the actual Jurassic Explorer melody. And I remember I just kind of like froze. And I just stood there and was like, and I remembered the moment. And I was just like being able to stand there and just listen to her play it and hear it live and hear it come through an instrument and hear the actual instrument perform it. I guess it added gravitas to what I had done. It made it seem much more real, much more important, not just me sitting in my room, playing away at a piano, hitting export and being like, there you go, it's done. You know, it was, it was more real because so many more people 
we're adding so much life to it. And it's it's a very, I, I don't really know how to describe it past that. Those who know me know that I was not in a position to write music a year and a half, two years ago. To be able to go, I want to take this seriously, I want to try this. And to go from that first moment where I played a couple things and sent Michael samples. I think the first word that comes to mind is brave because every step of the way it meant reminding myself to keep being brave and to keep trying and to keep going and to be able to look back and go, wow, like this was a journey. You know, this was such a simple little idea that Michael had and then to develop that into something that was season one and then have the amazing response people had and turn it into season two. And just to see how this keeps, not necessarily snowballing, but really the momentum it just keeps producing. And how many people have ended up being involved in it in some way. It really wouldn't have happened if it weren't for, you know, Michael and the production of the game and creating those ideas and each little step being so important. Watching this game be made was a very cool journey for me because as a brother, seeing my brother learn all these skills and, and learn how to 3D model and become a much more successful 3D artist was just really, really compelling to me and filled me with a sense of pride, honestly. And just to be able to see what he can create and what the whole team can create as a whole was just really amazing and it made me hopeful that both of us will be able to enter the game industry with a lot of success. Michael and Bernard are now working under a new team called Fluminous and are getting ready to launch their next journey with their first commercial demo. When we were working on JA Season 2, I also graduated from a game developer degree. Basically afterwards I got together with some of the people in the team and started creating this new game. our own IP this time, and it's called Ayalvata. It's a horror game, but not in the usual sense. We have on this planet a lot of ocean, we don't know a lot about, and this sort of goes into like what's out there, what's in the water, it sort of focuses around this island, where the player tries to basically figure out why they are stuck on the island and can't leave, and sort of what's going on that has caused the water around it to be much more dangerous and has caused these dangers uh, 
to attract to the island. So I'm the 3D environment artist on the team. River is the lead, but I kind of have a hand in that. We all kind of have a very equal say on what happens with the project and where we want it to go, which is really cool. Bernard's doing the music and he's having a lot of fun kind of going from, you know, something that was more happy with Jurassic Explorer to something more sci-fi and dark with Isle Vatra. So this is um, the project file for Isle Vatra, and this is basically the whole world we've already built. But even being so early in development, we've already progressed incredibly far. It's coming together really nicely, and I think you can see it's a lot more realistic than Jurassic Explorer ever was. With Jurassic Explorer, it was definitely more cartoony, it was more kind of capturing that innocence of a child wandering around a park and stuff, but this is at its core, sort of a horror game. So we had to make it more realistic. We had to make it darker, but we're still trying to keep those elements, especially like those wonder elements of, about Jurassic Park and Jurassic Explorer's art style. We're trying to carry those over to Isle Vatra and try to keep it still feeling like it is a game by us. I've made a lot of things like uh, submarines, and I've recently worked on our character a little bit as well, which is really fun. And I just keep pushing myself to, you know, evolve the style of the game. We're really trying to push the envelope of what we can do as a team. We've all come so far, not just as developers, but as people and understanding who we are as people, what our limits are, and more than anything, what our abilities are. Jurassic Explorer has given us all so much confidence in our abilities and it's pushed us, you know, just from this little tiny fan project that we just did in our spare times to something where, you know, we're making a game on a big platform and, and that's just, that's something I never thought would have happened and I'm incredibly grateful it has. So in Ayavatra, the cool thing is our creatures in the ocean uh, usually prehistoric. One of those main creatures, as you can even see in the logo, is our megalodon. There's a lot of elements that Jurassic Explorer has that we've even brought over to Isle Vatra, such as, you know, exploring an island, prehistoric creatures still being a part of our game. So that's a very interesting thing. And I'm excited to share that story of how it all comes together and, uh, you know, why this world has what it has. It's been really fun to kind of see how this project is evolving and, and seeing how, you know, you have those special moments that I've, I've held dear to myself with Jurassic Explorer, which I think every developer goes through, um, seeing things come to life. Seeing my models of like the submarine, for example, when River came in and programmed it and gave it physics, you could see it move and, and, and come to life and that's just a magical feeling and I, I, I live for those moments in game development because when you see these things come to life it's just unlike anything that you can experience. We're still very early on with Isle Vatra, we still have a long way to go until we can even release our demo to the public but this has been an incredible experience already and you know to have something created in such a short time that's actually coming together and it's a real product and it's not just a fan project it's now our own ip it's our own soul and our own character that means a lot to us and that's something that even with Jurassic Explorer, we always tried to make something of our own within that franchise. So now to have something truly our own is just, it's incredible. So what has been the biggest uh, help and support for you so far? Last year was an interesting year because with releasing season two in Jurassic Explorer, I had a lot of stress. And I think I found myself pushing myself too hard and not really knowing where I should draw the line and I'm very thankful that this year I've managed it so much better. But something I didn't have last year is my 
very supportive boyfriend. It's great to have people like that in my life that, you know, can support me and get me through those lows. It's been so much easier to come home and, you know, know that there is someone there that is able to understand what your work is and kind of like what you're going through. So to have that support is really helpful. It's not just the support of my boyfriend, it's also the support of my family, the support of my brother, of course. Everything around me is, you know, helping me get through this. So I'm incredibly thankful for all of that. In Jurassic Explorer for season one and season two, we basically wanted to make this poster and get it printed and we'd have, have it all signed by our names and um, just kind of hang it on our wall as something, you know, to look back on and be like, okay, we did this season one, we did season two, and these are our accomplishments for, you know, the last years that we've been working on these games, but we, <laughs> we never actually ended up doing it. We just kind of, I don't know, it slipped our fingers, I guess, and it just never really happened. Hopefully it's still something I want to do one day, so. Jurassic Explorer was a fan project, so it wasn't going to be perfect. It has many, many problems, but the good thing about it was that it was a project we could work on together. It was something that we could learn with and grow with, and that's always been its purpose since day one. What we've learned through the fan projects, they're so valuable, and they have gotten us to where we are today. Whether it's the ugly, <laughs> models you know of way back of Jurassic World 3D project if it weren't for those ugly models we wouldn't be making models like Ayavatra we wouldn't be doing anything like that so where can it take you what can you learn from that and how can you just keep pushing yourself to go forward for me personally an internal I guess like mantra would be never give up as cheesy as that is because I know that if I don't give up I will eventually get there. So it is the middle of the night here and I was literally just editing the documentary that you're watching right now, but my brother came into my room <laughs> And he gave me some news that's really absolutely life-changing. Let's document it. So, God, it must have been at least four or five months ago, I saw an opening for Mojang. I had just entered the industry um, working on some casual mobile games and I was learning a lot and I was very, you know, proud of what I've been able to achieve and learn in that time and I had some great people that I worked with. My passion has always been Minecraft and my passion has always been, I guess, serious game-centric experiences uh, versus more casual mobile games. And uh, to my surprise, I have finally arrived at an offer and I, again, I am very, very happy about it. Um, like this only happened today. So I, again, I'm in a shock and it's, it, it's hard to process it. It's a life changing moment. It's something that you can't really grapple with, especially for me, where for my entire life, I have been trying to think of how can I not just be a game developer, but how can I be a game developer that pushes boundaries? And I think Mojang in particular is, is, is a company that from, from its very roots, it has created a game that has inspired and pushed the boundaries of so many people in the world. If it wasn't for Minecraft, I would not learn programming. Maybe eventually I would, but not in the way that I have. I, I've seen so many kids who have picked up these amazing skills of programming, art, design, you name it, and, and they've done it. Minecraft inspired me. It made me strive to create experiences. Redefine failure. You, right. Failure is not failure. It's it's really, it's you grow. Over this whole process of the past 10 years of me doing modding, there's been plenty of failures within my process of designing new projects. Don't think of it that way. Always think of failures as just learning experiences. Knowing that like, you know, Brandon has worked on Jurassic Explorer with us. He's helped us so much throughout the process on programming. To know that someone like that is going to be working at Minecraft or like anything in the industry like that is really, is kind of terrifying because like, 
I guess it, it on one hand, it kind of sets this expectation for me now. <laughs> it's hard to put into words like how I feel because it's mind blowing, like knowing that he's going to be working at something that somebody, I mean, pretty much everybody I know has played Minecraft. Every adult knows of Minecraft and to, to know that one of the biggest games in the world at this moment in time, especially an indie game like that, he, that he's going to be, you know, working for them and being a part of that and evolving that story is, is absolutely crazy. Like, I, I, I really can't articulate that into any words, honestly. <laughs> well, it's interesting with Jurassic Explorer and, and more importantly, Michael as my brother, we have kind of gone in a sort of parallel a journey in a sense and I mean this this whole experience is about exploring this journey together as game developers. I was always uh, someone who was talking about I wanted to be a game developer but right alongside me was Michael. I'm not the cause of that which is the interesting thing. It is his own agency and his own ability and drive to want to create experiences that led him down that path. I was just one of the people who was along with him for that journey and I'm very proud to be part of that journey and to see that both of us are actually starting to get, you know, really serious about this and really serious about game development. It's it's exciting. I, I just think this whole experience is exciting and 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 humbling and uh, crazy. <laughs> after I end up seeing a movie and there's a part in it where a character literally says, hey, thanks for playing my game. I'm in the theater and I just start crying because it hits me. I should be saying that to all the people who are playing the game. There's no reason why anyone should be doing anything. They don't have to watch a video. They don't have to watch a movie. They don't have to play my game. They don't have to download it. They don't have to listen to it. They don't do any of this, but that they are electing to do it it's, it's an intangible and hard to like even put into words feeling to realize that these people are taking time, taking effort to download it and so eager to play it. And then, you know, they spend hours playing it that all these people have experienced my music, experienced the game we've produced. And again, none of that had to happen. They didn't have to do that. And so just that, that feeling of being grateful that something I did might inspire someone to do something similar, might inspire someone to take their first steps. And all because they chose to do something that they didn't have to do. And I guess similarly, we chose to make the game that we didn't have to make.
Thank you. Thank you all for playing our game. Happy exploring! <laughs>